<laughs> it's the Lake District, actually. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm. Oh, so Tom. Oh, I haven't realized it's you again. I thought it's Andy now. Okay. No, it is me again. Yes, I'm but afraid so, Roger. It means, Roger, you weren't you weren't at the earlier part of the conference, or if you were, you weren't paying attention. Uh, I wasn't earlier. I had other things than what you. <laughs> but yeah, okay, good. I, that's <laughs> oh, hang on, just sharing your desktop, not your uh, not your slides. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing actually because I've got the wrong slides. Um, <laughs> Take a Actually, uh, are your slides online? Oh, that as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, they are. I mean, the, it's the same link as last time, except instead of one, it's two. Um, I, I guess I should post that. I the link. Yeah, I guess I forgot the link, yeah. Um, okay, let me just sort this out. Uh, okay, um, so do I need to post them now? I suppose I do. Uh, yeah, that'd be great if you just put them in chat. Okay. Yeah, you need you need to post them now because Dominic downloads them and writes notes on them while you're talking. Right. <laughs> All right. Have you found the link, Tom? Um, I, just I, have it. I have it if you want it. Uh, right, uh, chats, where's the chat? Okay, so I'm going to mute everybody and then Ian and Tom can unmute themselves and we're ready to go. Thank you, Robert. Yep. So Ian? Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to welcome or welcome back Tom Bridgeland, who is going to give us the second part of his trilogy. So over to you, Tom. And you have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was on it for once. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Ian. Um, okay, so this is the second lecture. I think all the technical stuff is done now. So um, before I start, I just want to... Um, uh, just um, recap a couple of slides from last time, um, we, just to make a couple of remarks somehow inspired by uh, Marcos and um, Maxime's talks. Um, so in any case, it's good to remember this. Um, so um, we, we thought about this um, class of differential equations. Um, so, the, the, the important point about this was that it had an irregular singularity at the origin somehow. But um, so remember, it was just a differential equation for a matrix valued function of a complex variable epsilon. And this was the differential equation here. And because of this epsilon squared, we had an irregular singularity. And I discussed a little bit about how you, how you define the Stokes data, the Stokes factors of such um, a differential equation. Um, uh, and basically, I want to, um, I mean, if Maxim and Jan are around, <laughs> feel free to correct me, but the way I think of their concept of a stability structure, if you remember, Maxim uh, talked about a stability structure, it depended on a Lie algebra, G. And the way I think about those things is that they're basically encoding Stokes data of a connection of this form. So part of the data of a stability structure, first you have to choose a Lie algebra and it has to have some grading. And then there is a central charge as they call it, um, which is a function on the grading. So uh, that's really what you put here. And, um, and then I think those Lie algebra elements should be thought of as Stokes data. Um, so I just want to make the remark that you can take the Laplace transform of this equation. Um, and if you do that, you actually get an equation with regular singularities. Um, and those singularities are actually at the points ui, which are the eigenvalues 
of this leading order term here. So we know that kind of, um, you know, if you try and formally solve this equation here, you can do that as a formal power series in epsilon. You know, you write e to the minus u over epsilon times some formal power series, but that will have radius of convergence zero usually. So it's just the sort of thing we've been talking about. To make sense of it, you have to take um, a Borel sum. Um, but so in this very simple example, you can sort of see why the Borel transform is going to have nice properties. So for example, just a, a collection of regular, you know, a collection of simple, uh, of ordinary poles, regular singularities, just because, you, you know, if you Laplace transform this equation, that, that will be the case. So, you know, I think that is a sort of relevant observation for this whole business about why are wall crossing structures leading to resurgent functions? Of course, we're not really in this situation where G is um, uh, a finite dimensional Lie algebra anymore. We're more thinking about some um, Lie algebra of, of, of vector fields, so a group of diffeomorphisms. Um, but still, I think the same sort of thing maybe applies. So anyway, so that, that was certainly one of the things we were thinking about. And remember, we, we talked about um, there's some PDE, which describes how you should vary the, the matrix V as a function of the matrix U to ensure that the Stokes data is constant. Um, although we discussed that constant is not quite the right thing to say because these Stokes rays can collide and cross each other. And then you have to make sense of what you mean by the Stokes data being constant. Okay, but we discussed a bit about that. So this is this differential equation um, controlling the, uh, the isomonodromic deformations. And then we decided we would change the group G from GLN to some group of automorphisms or diffeomorphisms of uh, really symplectomorphisms of C star to the N. And we say, said that in that context, you could sort of view DT invariance as defining Stokes data for such a connection. Um, so I'm saying here that the wall crossing formula, we said that it's completely analogous to this isomonodromy condition or isostokes condition for some family of meromorphic connections on the trivial G bundle over P1, which have got exactly the same form as before. So instead of a, a differential equation, I'm talking about um, a connection, same thing, of course. Um, and here, um, what I put here should be in the kind of Cartan piece of my Lie algebra. And I discussed that that is um, uh, invariant vector fields. So the central charge counts as one of those because you can view it as an element of the tangent space at the identity to my torus. So I put Z there and here I must put some function F, which I don't know. I don't know what the function is. It's implicitly defined by saying that it's what you put so that this connection has the correct Stokes data, namely the, the Stokes data given by the DT invariants. And then since I'm sort of by fiat saying that that DT data is constant, that wall, you know, that um, Stokes data is constant, or at least the wall crossing formula is satisfied, which is the kind of correct way of saying that, then um, I should expect F to satisfy some um, isomonodromy differential equation. You know, I implicitly, implicitly define F by having certain fixed Stokes data. As I vary Z, this function F should satisfy some PDE, which was basically the one that was on the previous slide. Um, and just to get, bef you know, th this is a sort of a, a very vague comment somehow inspired by what happened in Marcos's talk. Um, that, as I said before, the, um, the, you can try and think about what is the Laplace transform of this equation and it will have regular singularities. And now I think the, the regular singularities should be at the point Z of gamma, because um, uh, you basically just pair this Cartan element with the roots. Um, and so that's exactly, well, or that's the sort of behavior Marcos was explaining in, in, in this case of um, topological string theory, he showed us a, a, nice, a, a nice picture where the poles of the Borel transform were at the 
central charges of classes gamma, or in other words, the periods of the mirror. So, um, so that seems to sort of fit with this story. And in fact, in the next lecture, we, I will do a very simple example of um, the topological string partition function just for the resolved conifold. So much simpler than the example Marcos was discussing, but, and we will see this, this kind of behavior. Um, anyway, and yes, and so just to return to the point, we, we discussed that this F should satisfy the isomonodromy equation. And if you slightly repackage F in this function on the tangent space to stability conditions, then you get, um, you, you get that this function satisfies um, um, a, a slightly different PDE, which is known in the literature as Plibansky's second heavenly equation. So out of all this analogy, what we end up saying is that we somehow expect there to be a function on the tangent bundle of stability conditions, which is defined by the DT invariance, but in a very implicit way by the DT invariance. And we'll sort of try and understand how to make that less implicit, um, and which satisfies this interesting PDE. Okay, so um, the, the, the talk today is gonna sort of be two parts. And in the first part, um, I'm gonna try and talk about the geometry um, that this PDE satisfied by this function, you, you know, what is the geometry behind that PDE? Um, so, so it's some complex hypercalar geometry. Um, of course, it's a little bit embarrassing to be talking about this sort of thing in front of genuine, geomet genuine differential geometers who know these things much better than I do. But uh, anyway, I hope they'll take it in, uh, in a kind spirit and I'm sure I'll learn something uh, from them. Okay, so um, what's the sort of summary of, of this talk? Um, as I've just discussed, the wall crossing formula tells you that DT invariance should be thought of as defining some kind of Stokes data. Um, the relevant group is um, this group of automorphisms of the torus. I, I, I don't like it when I say that. <laughs> so what I mean is I think about this complex manifold, C star to the N, and I think of automorphisms of that complex manifold, um, which just preserve this um, Poisson bracket. We said that this is equipped with some natural Poisson bracket. And, um, and when I, even when I say automorphisms, I don't really mean automorphisms. They're, you know, this is a little bit heuristic. In, in reality, these are going to be somewhat partially defined automorphisms. Um, but anyway, the, the, at a heuristic level, this is the right group. And actually, for the, for, for the purposes of this talk, it's, it's sort of important that I'm, I'm going to assume that this Poisson bracket is non-degenerate at this point. So you can sort of always fix that by passing to some sub locus in stability space, um, basically defined by the kernel of this form, <laughs> right? So in other words, stability, this Poisson structure also gives us, you know, this Poisson structure comes from the Euler form, essentially. Um, that also gives you a Poisson structure on stability space itself. And I can just take a symplectic leaf of that Poisson structure. I mean, it's a linear Poisson structure. Anyway, so you take a symplectic leaf of that. That's a submanifold in stability space. And that's really where I should be working here. Um, alternatively, just assume that the Euler form is non-degenerate from the start, and then everything is fine. OK. And as Greg pointed out in my talk, and um, it's not the first time Greg's told me this, um, so I should be start being more careful about it, clearly, that one should assume some growth conditions on the DT invariant. So the sort of examples I'm studying are very simple examples, um, typically defined by quivers and, and rather simple quivers, um, where the DT invariants don't grow very fast. By that, I mean, you know, the DT invariants, there is a DT invariance for each point in a lattice, namely the Grotendieck group, some, some copy of Z to the N. And basically, as I get larger and larger, points in this lattice, I don't want the DT invariance to grow exponentially. Okay, and you know, um, Greg was pointing out to me that if you took a compact Calabi L threefold, these DT invariants absolutely would grow exponentially. Um, and that is certainly gonna cause trouble. Um, I, I hope it's interesting trouble. So I hope that, you know, this picture that I'm describing here will need some modification for sure but I'm hoping that that's kind of an interesting thing rather than just tearing the whole thing up and forgetting about it. 
<laughs> okay, but there's certainly a lot, a lot of classes of examples where you do have these exponential growth conditions and you're gonna get something interesting. Um, and I should say uh, that... Uh, uh, Boris Pialine wrote a paper pointing out that it's interesting trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then as we've just been discussing, the space M, M is gonna be the space of stability conditions in this talk. This parameterizes, as we've just been discussing, some isomonodromic family of, of meromorphic connections. And then somehow, as I've been pushing in the, in the last talk, I, I very much like the analogy with GLN and you know, the analogy between this situation where G is this group and the group GLN where things are much better understood and really the theory in that case is um, semi-simple Frobenius manifold. So when M is a semi-simple Frobenius manifold, it has an iso isomonodromic family of meromorphic connections on trivial GLN bundles over P1. And that's more or less what a Frobenius structure, or what a semi-simple Frobenius structure is. I mean, that's, that really is most of the structure, except there are a few little extra whistles and bells um, and and similarly, in this story I'm describing, there are some extra things like an Euler vector field. There's a certain symmetry property that you should impose. So we introduced some terminology for this. Um, so this is uh, me and Ian. We call this um, analogous gadget. So that the thing that's analogous to a semi-simple Frobenius manifold, um, we call it a Joyce structure. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you what that is um, later. And the reason we, call it after Dominic, is those functions F alpha, F gamma that I appeared on the previous slide. I mean, he, he was the first to sort of write down those functions using the DT invariants, or rather he wrote sort of formal generating functions um, for those things. Um, and so the main, um, the main ingredient in this Joyce structure is some kind of complex hypercalar structure on the total space of the tangent bundle of M. I mean, note that there is, um, as I said, I'm assuming this Poisson structure is non-degenerate. So we have a symplectic form on M. Non so whether I say tangent bundle or cotangent bundle doesn't make very much difference. Um, so, that, so they can be identified. So if you're a bit scared, you know, you're a bit surprised by this being tangent rather than cotangent, it doesn't really matter. But I mean, actually I find the, it more convenient to write it on the tangent bundle. Um, oh yes, and I, I should just say that, I mean, throughout this stability condition story, as I said a little bit last time, um, there is just a doubling of dimension that goes on that is, um, at first sight, it's a bit annoying. It, physicists tend to find it unnatural. Um, and, you know, well, I, I can't really argue with that, but it's just, we are trying to work in a very general framework here. I mean, our, our basic input is a triangulated category or CY3 triangulated category. And we want everything to work in this very general context. And, you know, there are certain natural constructions and they spit out this space of stability conditions, which seems to contain interesting spaces as half dimensional subspaces of it. Um, as I discussed last time. And, you know, it's not sort of, um, <laughs> I'm not deliberately doubling the dimension. It's just that's the only thing that exists that I know how to define in this very general context. Okay, so let's just talk about the dimension for a minute. Suppose we took the um, Fukai category of some compact CY3 fold, then, you know, the moduli space of complex structures would have complex dimension H21. Right, that Hodge number. Um, if I also include a holomorphic three form in my moduli space, that's H21 plus one. So that's this moduli space here. So the space of stability conditions is not of that dimension, it's twice that dimension, twice that complex dimension. So the moduli of complex structures is, is like a Lagrangian submanifold inside STAB. And then now I'm talking about taking the tangent bundle to STAB. Right, so I double the dimension again. So this hypercalar structure, complex hypercalar structure, is living in a space of dimension four times this. Right, whereas I think physicists would much more normally consider something 
which is a bundle, you know, over complex moduli space, with, whose fibers are the intermediate Jacobians. So those are compact tori. So that would have exactly half this dimension, the total space of that um, S1N vibration. Okay, so it's really a kind of complexified thing here. And as I say, it's not a deliberate thing, it's just that, that's what comes out. Okay. So let me um, uh, sort of just start from the beginning. So what, what is a complex hypercalar structure? I'm sure, I'm sure you can guess. So let's take a complex manifold with and Tx is, is going to be its holomorphic tangent bundle. Um, and so I'm going to ask for a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form, so a complex metric. So this is some holomorphically varying thing. And ijk endomorphisms um, satisfying the usual relations, which preserve the metric and the parallel for the, Le the Levi-Civita connection, for the holomorphic connection on this holomorphic tangent bundle. Okay. So that's what I mean by a complex hypercalar structure. And when I've got one of those, I want to think about these holomorphic, uh, I shouldn't have said symplectic, yeah, bad. Holomorphic two forms, that's somehow the, for, the point, they're not non-degenerate. So holomorphic two forms, which I get by doing this, taking the metric and putting J plus, plus minus IK in here. And notice just from the algebra of the quaternions that um, the kernels of these two forms are the eigenspaces for the operator i. Okay, so the plus or minus i, plus or minus little i, eigenspaces for the operator i. And in particular, they're half dimensional. Okay, so the, the important thing is that these two things, these two subspaces, um, Define for define you some uh, uh, what are those things called um, integrable half dimensional sub sub bundles of your tangent bundle. So now that's that's going to be important. Okay, so we we have these half dimensional spaces. So um, well, so we have these two forms whose kernels are half dimensional. So we make the following definition. We ask for a holomorphic map to some space which is going to, to a complex manifold, which is going to be half dimensional. Um, and I ask that this omega minus is the pullback of some holomorphic symplectic form downstairs on M. So everything in this story is holomorphic. Okay, so that's a reason, you know, reasonable thing to do. And I'll explain in, as we go down this slide why, why, it's, why we called it an affine symplectic vibration. So the first thing to note is that um, this plus i eigenspace for the operator i, as we said, was the kernel of this form omega minus. But since this form is pulled back from the base, that's going to coincide with the vertical subbundle. Okay, so we have this map pi, so we can look at the vertical subbundle of the tangent bundle. And so that tells you straight away that the dimension of X is twice the dimension of the base. And then um, because the kernel of omega plus is the other eigenspace of I, so it never intersects the vertical tangent space. So that tells me that omega plus will restrict to give an actual non-degenerate two form, a holomorphic symplectic form on each fiber of pi. So we get these symplectic forms on the fibers. And so that's why we call it a symplectic vibration. And then the other thing is that because, um, let's see, again, this, um, this other eigenspace of the operator I doesn't intersect the vertical thing. So it gets the push forward, identifies it with the tangent space downstairs on M. So if I invert that map, that means I can lift tangent vectors from M up into X by just insisting that they lie in this other eigenspace. Okay. Um, and that's gonna be important. And then finally, I hope this is finally, if I then compose with J, the operator J swaps the two eigenspaces 
um, of i. So this gives me a different way of lifting vectors, tangent vectors from downstairs, but these all end up in the vertical. They end up in the other eigenspace, which we've already said is the, is the kind of vertical subbundle. So this is somehow the really important data here. It's two ways of pulling up tangent vectors from n into, into tangent vectors to x. And so, in fact, these lifting maps define for you, um, you know, nonlinear connections, Erisman connections on this bundle pi. I mean, a connection like that is just something that enables you to lift vector fields from downstairs into the into the upstairs thing. Okay, and I can, you know, I can vary epsilon here and get a whole pencil of those things. And you can see that these these preserve this symplectic structure omega plus. Okay, so you can already see why you're getting a connection with um, uh, pencils of connections with values in this group of symplectomorphisms. Because if you imagine your fibers being C star to the N, then this pencil of Erisman connections is giving you some way of parallel trans, you know, identifying C star to the Ns, you know, <laughs> as you vary your points in N. Okay, so. So that's, you're already seeing that kind of connection. Uh, so I think um, I have a picture here. That, this might help. So from now on, we're going to assume a special situation of this, that we're going to take M to be some complex manifold, and we're going to X to, is going to be the total space of the tangent bundle of that manifold with this projection map. And so we're looking for hypercalar, complex hypercalar structures on X which make this thing one of these affine symplectic um, vibrations. Okay. And then in that case, we already have a way of lifting tangent vectors from downstairs into um, vertical tangent vectors because the vertical, because this is the, you know, this is just a bundle, it's the tangent bundle. So we are, um, so the vertical tangent vectors are already identified with the tangent vectors of M. Okay, so we've already got a way of lifting those. And we just ask that this thing is, this LV that was defined on the previous slide is the obvious lift, um, which exists by virtue of this being <coughs> the tangent bundle. Okay, so here's my attempt at drawing a picture of this. Here's M, here's X, the tangent bundle of M. If I have some vector, tangent vector downstairs, there's two ways I can lift it. I can either lift it vertically so it and that's the kind of obvious thing to do and then the non-trivial data is the ways of lifting it horizontally and because this is a non-linear connection there's no relation between the lift at two different points of the fiber here somehow okay so that's um that's the basic picture um and somehow if you've got this picture if you've got this erisman connection it's not so hard to define the, the, um, the hypercalar structure because you know that the vertical stuff is the one of the eigenspaces of I and the horizontal thing is the other eigenspace of I. And then you basically need to know J, which is some map exchanging these two eigenspaces. But since they're both identified with this one space here, you've got a way of mapping from one to the other. Okay, so once you have this picture and you're, you know, once you have these lifting maps, it's easy to define the hypercalar structure. Okay. Right, and so I said that the joy structure is some extra whistles and bells that you put on this thing. So let me just quickly say what those are. Um, so um, firstly, there is some vector field, some holomorphic vector field on X, um, which you know, preserves the structure in some appropriate way. Okay, so these are the lead derivatives with respect to E, and um, those are some relations. I'm going to say this again in terms of the, you know, you, I mean, I'm going to soon move to a local description of this structure, and then I'll be able to say what this means, you know, much more easily by just saying some function is homogeneous, right? So anyway, so you, I don't, well, I mean, some of you guys probably can process this. I, I can't process that very well. Um, there should be some action of minus one on the fibers of pi, 
sorry, there, there is an action of minus one on the five of the pi. This is just the tangent bundle after all. Um, and the, um, the metric and i, j, and k should be preserved by that in some way. And um, finally, I want some, I don't really want this structure to live on the total on us, you know, this is a vector bundle over n. Instead of that, I want a C star to the n bundle over n. So in other words, I want to quotient this by some lattice, some bundle of lattices. Okay, so in, e in each um, fiber, I should have some um, Z to the n lattice and everything should basically descend to the quotient. So in this talk, several times, there's going to be some confusion about um, whether, this C, whether the fibers are C star to the N or C to the N. Okay, so in the, in the talk yesterday, I was talking about this group of automorphisms of C star to the N. Now we seem to have some talking about some map where the fibers are C to the N. I mean, just forget about this difference. You know, you can either talk about periodic things on C to the N or things on C star to the N. But certainly this periodicity should be, should be here. Um, Tom, M is complex or holomorphic symplectic? Um, it, M, is, M is a complex manifold and it has a holomorphic symplectic form on it, yes. Does that answer? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So M is, in our example, is going to be the space, well, I mean, M is the space of stability conditions, um, except that I'm currently assuming that the Euler form is non-degenerate, so that's that kind of um, <clears throat> that constant um, Poisson bracket, which is just the central charge is the bracket of Zi with Zj is epsilon ij. So that's the symplectic structure on it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to give you some local description, which will then link up with that Plavansky function we saw before. So let's just take some Darboux coordinate system for this holomorphic symplectic form on N. And then of course I get linear coordinates on the tangent fibers by just writing a tangent vector in terms of the corresponding basis vectors. Okay, so now I have coordinates Zi and theta J on my total space X, which is where this hyperkähler structure is gonna live. Um, and then so uh, if I lift d by dz i, I mean, this is just because I asked that that lifting, that vertical lifting map should be the standard thing. So that really just means that d by dz i gets lifted to d by d theta i. And then the interesting data is the horizontal lifts, okay? Um, once you have these, then as I was saying, the hyperkähler structure is, is, is kind of trivial. You, you, you know, i is, i, j, and k are operating in these standard ways in this basis, okay? So I'm just writing this to, um, to tell you that really the only interesting data here is these horizontal lifts. Um, and um, that pencil of, so those, that pencil of Erisman connections is the thing where to lift d by dz i, you, you lift it to h i plus epsilon inverse v i. Okay, and for that connection to be flat, you need this relation. Okay, so this is the, this is the condition on, for the flatness of that pencil of connections. So it's a kind of lax equation. Okay. And then how do you get this Plavansky function? you write down, uh, you write this HI in this form. So somehow because this horizontal, because the flow of this connection is supposed to preserve a symplectic form, it should be a Hamiltonian vector field. Um, and so you shouldn't be surprised to see some expression like this. Um, and that lax equation tells you that there is a single, fun rather than being one Hamiltonian for each I, there is a single W that gives you all these all these Hamiltonian flows. So basically, so you can write this, um, these horizontal lifts in, in this form, and then that lax equation becomes this second heavenly equation that we, we have before. Okay. So that's, <coughs> that's somehow what the geometry of, uh, of this equation is. And then these extra whistles and bells that we were saying before are very natural in this context. It's just saying that W, the Euler field is saying W should have some homogeneity property. 
in the zi's, it should be an odd function of the theta i's. And then it should be periodic in the theta i's. But in, in fact, I mean, it's really only the second derivatives that you care about. And you should ask that those are periodic. Um, so that's the very indirect way of, um, of getting this. Uh, so we saw that the DT invariants, you should think of them as Stokes data for some connection. If you can get your hands on that connection, then you will have this function W. And then if you make these definitions, you would, uh, you would get that complex hyperkähler structure. But there's kind of an easier, you know, there's a more conceptual thing, which is that these this pencil of Erisman connections is the kind of is the ice well is the thing that goes with the isomonodromy connection. Yeah, it's the isomonodromy connection. Okay. Can I ask a question? So, uh, sure, please do. Uh, what do you know? What is uh, this Plibansky function uh, in uh, uh, the formalism of Gayota Murnitsky? Um, Oh, sorry, where am I? Um, well, I'm not sure there is one, but I mean, um, Greg is here. He may be able to um, contradict me on that. I mean, they were constructing, um, uh, I mean, they were interested in genuine real hyperkähler manifolds and which were, you know, in the same setting would have half the dimension as the one I've got. So, um, you know, they, they would construct some hyperkähler metric, but I don't know what the link is between that hyperkähler metric and the one and the complex hyperkähler metric that I'm discussing here. So, so yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, agree with that. That. Could it be related to a hyper, hyper holomorphic bundle over the cool, uh, over the uh, Hitchin moduli space, for example? But I mean, that would only increase the dimension. But, uh, oh, um, yeah, 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 I don't yeah, know. Depending on the dimension, depending on what hyper holomorphic bundle you're talking about, uh, could be. But as I know, this uh, heavenly equation, it describes, uh, well, for example, it appears in the context of four-dimensional hyperkähler manifolds, yeah? Uh, so yeah. It means that if one takes this GMN story uh, in the simplest uh, case when it's four-dimensional, uh, there should be such an equation, there should be a function uh, which describes the corresponding metric. Yes. I mean... It, it, I mean, in GMN, it, it is true that they write down a pencil of connections of a slightly different kind um, in that it's, it's got um, two poles of order two, one at um, uh, my parameter epsilon would become zeta in their story and they would have poles at zeta equals zero and zeta equals infinity. Um, and you know, the, this, it, that connection has three terms. One is Z and one is Z bar, but there is something in the middle which presumably is, I mean, that's the thing I would look at because that's closely related to the thing. I mean, W is my, is defining the extra term in my connection as Z over epsilon squared plus something else over epsilon. And so in, in GMN, that would be the kind of middle term in their connection. And I would have thought there might be some relation with that. Um, can, I, can I think of W as an analog of Keller potential? No, I think, well, I think that's the first heavenly equation. There is an alternative framework for all this where there's a, there's a different heavenly equation. And I think that's the Kähler potential. I mean, these, these are related just by simple differential relations. So yeah, second, sorry. The, yeah. So the second derivative of W is related to the second derivative of the Kähler potential for I. Yeah. Yeah, there is something that looks a bit like a Legendre transform, but isn't, apparently. Okay, so sure. <laughs> should we leave that to further discussions later? Um, okay, so I'm, you know, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to try and describe some class of examples of these things, um, which will be partly conjectural, unfortunately. Um, okay, but before I do that, I just want to point out one extra piece of data that you get out of this um, structure, um, which is another. Um, connection, linear connection on the tangent bundle of M. So the first thing to observe is that in, in, in this definition of a joy structure, I asked for some periodicity. And that means that I have some bundle of lattices in my tangent bundle. 
right? Because I wanted to quotient by those things. So that already tells me that, that I must have some fixed um, connection on the tangent bundle um, in mind, where, you know, for which this bundle of lattices is flat, okay? So that's the thing in, in, in this stability world, the space of stability conditions always does have a flat torsion-free connection on it. It's the thing whose flat coordinates are just the central charge coordinates. Um, so, I mean, remember the, um, the space of stability conditions is naturally, there is a map to a vector space, which is a local homeomorphism. So that certainly gives you an affine structure on, on the space. And that's this one. <clears throat> so that's kind of a boring thing. But if you take the Levi-Civita connection of this hypercalar structure, so that's, um, that's a linear connection, of course, on the tangent bundle to X. If you look at it on the zero section, um, along the zero section, it actually preserves the tangent vectors to the zero section. That's that result is true because of this involution property, this oddness property that I'm assuming. So it turns out that you then get another flat torsion-free connection on, on T, connection on TM. Forget about the metric there. Um, so, and so I'm labeling that J and in coordinates, it's, it's given by this equation. So I take the third derivatives, but I just look near theta equals zero, near the zero section. Remember theta are the kind of fiber coordinates, Z are the coordinates on my manifold N. Okay. Um, and this connection was actually written down by Dominic as well. So this is something that he, he, he constructed. I mean, again, he was, he was sort of working in a rather formal setting. I mean, as indeed I am, <laughs> so, you know, but um, anyway, so he wrote down this connection. But, um, you know, it's an important point. This I've written in little because it didn't really fit on the slide, but it shouldn't be so little. Um, the actual examples, we're going to have to allow this structure to develop poles. I mean, you, you just see it when you calculate things that in general, you're going to get poles to your function W. So your hypercalar structure is developing singularities. And we don't really know where those singularities are, although in the examples I've seen, which aren't so many, they're not um, near theta equals zero. But of course, it's very important that they're not. Otherwise, you know, this could just not make, you know, this could just not be a thing, <laughs> could not be a well-defined thing. Okay, so it's just a kind of warning. But other than that, you seem to get some new interesting connection on the tangent bundle of stability space, which would, which is good. And in examples, it seems that the these kind of half dimensional spaces that I'm very much interested in defining and understanding are actually just flat in the flat coordinates for this other connection. So once you have this other connection, you just you take the flat coordinates for this other connection and you just set some of the coordinates equal to um, uh, constant. Half the, you, you set half the coordinates to be constant, that will cut out some half dimensional space. And in examples, those seem to coincide with these kind of interesting submanifolds we would like to get our hands on. Um, so this seems to be an interesting object. Um, but yeah, I mean, this whole subject is uh, unfortunately not, you know, crystal clear yet that it's the right thing because we don't have enough examples calculated. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some examples. And unfortunately, I mean, again, this would be, um, you know, it'd be nicer to be talking about this in three or four months time um, when I would hope that I would have sort of written down the details properly um, and be more sure about them. But uh, anyway, I'll try and describe the picture. And there is one example where I have done the calculations in full, full detail, the so-called A2 example. Um, so, you know, this, this is not the empty, the, the set of things where this actually works is not the empty set. Okay, so this is the example that uh, Ivan was talking about last night. Um, so it's an example of a space of stability conditions where you get um, the answer is a space of quadratic differentials. So we're going to take M to be um, this, this space of pairs where S is going to be some Riemann surface, compact Riemann surface of genus G, and Q is going to be some um, quadratic differential on S with simple zeros. Okay. And so strictly speaking, we're sort of, well, we're also interested in the, in, in the analog where we allow these differentials to have poles. Uh, we're possibly more interested in those, but um, to keep the notation simple, I will talk about this one first. Um, 
So of course, you know, just again to make this complexification point, um, this space, you know, what you might instead do is fix the Riemann surface, consider just quadratic differentials on that Riemann surface, that would be the Hitchin base. And then you would take some vibration over that of compact tori, S1 to the N. And that would be the moduli space of Higgs bundles and that would have a real hypercalar structure on it, okay? But I'm not doing that. I'm considering something with twice the dimension because I'm varying S. So I have something with twice the dimension in the base. And then I'm gonna consider some C star to the N bundle. Um, algebraic tori. So again, that will double the dimension of the fibers. So the whole thing will have twice the dimension. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think that's all I want to say there. So again, in Ivan's talk, we, we saw this. So for each quadratic differential Q, we get some double cover living in the cotangent bundle of S, which is just given locally by this equation, y squared equals Q of X. So it's a branched double cover. But since this has assumed to have simple zeros, this is a smooth, um, it's a Riemann surface and we have some covering map here and a covering involution. And if I take the cohomology of these S hats, um, actually I want to take the anti-invariant part as Ivan also did um, with respect to this covering involution. Um, I get some bundle of lattices over my space Q of G. Um, and so one of the things about this doubling of dimensions, which is a kind of a non-trivial thing and a nice thing, is that this space now has um, a local biholomorphism to a complex vector space. Okay, so this is just a copy of C to the N. And this map, you know, it's a complicated and interesting map, but near every point here, it's a local analytic isomorphism. Um, so here I had to take the universal cover of this space for this map to be well defined because that lattice of cohomology groups has some monodromy. But this map takes a pair and considers, uh, well, I really should have pulled this back. So if I take the square root of Q, that's a well-defined thing on this double cover and it defines some holomorphic one form and I take the Durham cohomology class of that holomorphic one form. Okay, so now I want to think, so this is gonna be my analog of the space of stability conditions. And now I want to think about the tangent space to that, the total space of the tangent space to, to that. So how can, you know, what does that parameterize? Well, it basically parameterizes these things. So I've got S and Q as before, that's in the base. And now I want to take a line bundle on the spectral curve and an abelian connection, well, and a holomorphic connection on it. So this ab means abelian because this is a line bundle. Okay. So, so there is some extra stuff here. You have to choose. Um, I mean, this is kind of an anti-invariance property for the line bundle L and a condition on its degree. And <clears throat> this connection is not gonna be on L because L will actually have degree something like 2G minus two, I think. Um, but if you tensor it by the pullback dual, this will have degree zero, so it could have a, um, a holomorphic connection on it. And I ask that that's anti-invariant. Okay. And so why am I doing this? Um, could L be a, a square root of the canonical bundle, the spin structure? Or is that not an example of what you have? Um, of, of which canonical bundle? Um, uh, of the cover of S. Uh, S um, uh, now I'm thinking, so what degree does that have? That has something like degree 8G minus 8 or something. I think that's got the wrong degree. Um, it, it, it's, yeah, no, sorry. It's more like a square root of this bundle. I mean, as you can see. Oh, sorry, like sorry. I meant, I meant the square, sorry. I meant the pullback of the square root of the canonical bundle of S. Uh, yes, that's. Right, uh, would that be good? Once you've chosen a spin structure. Yes. Um, yes, I think that's, yes, I think that's right. I think that's allowed, yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, you may have hit, the, <laughs> there is a subtlety about spin structures here and I think you may have hit it. 
I, I think I want to end up quotienting out by the action of those spin structures. Um, yeah, there is a subtlety about Z to the 2G and I think that's exactly what it is. Um, so, I, so let me just say, why am I considering these things? Basically, I'm trying to make a C star to the N here, or I'm, I'm trying to represent H1 S hat C star. Um, and this is how I do it because the monodromy of this line bundle with this connection on it is gonna live in C star to the N. It's, it's gonna live in this group. Um, but there's some slight subtleties about how you do it. Okay, so, I mean, because of this local hol biholomorphism, the fibers of this map are just, you know, the tangent space here is just this vector space. So th this is what the fibers of the tangent bundle are. And then I claim that the fibers of this space are copies of C star H1. It, you know, it's the C star thing. Um, so it, uh, this is exactly, I think, relating to what Greg's point is, but let me not get into the full details here, but this is not quite right. You need to quotient X by this finite group of spin structures from downstairs. Um, but anyway, what we want to do is construct some um, pencil of nonlinear connections on this map, right? Because that's, as I've been explaining, that's, um, that's really what this structure is about. So how do we do that? Um, well, what we do is we relate it, we're gonna make X birational to another space, which has a kind of obvious pencil of connections on it. Um, so what's that other space? It's as follows. So sorry, this is a little complicated. So this space parameterizes the following data, a Riemann surface of genus G, that's always coming along, a rank two bundle on S with trivial determinant, and then a connection and a Higgs field living on the same bun on this bundle E, okay? And the reason this is a nice thing is that I can consider the monodromy of Nabla plus epsilon inverse phi, right? So phi is something I can use to perturb Nabla. And then I can look at the isomonodromy connection for all those different epsilon. And that will give me a pencil of connections on this space. Well, I'll say that in a minute. But there is a, there is a map um, <coughs> down to quadratic differentials by taking the determinant of the Higgs field here. And then, as I say, I, I mean, I've written down a proof of the following fact, but the tricky thing is persuading someone to read it, um, even myself. Um, the, the statement I claim is that the, this, this space X is actually birational to this space P of G. Okay, and so what's the content of this? So we already know that sort of, um, well, both of them have got a Riemann surface in them. We already know that the, the, the usual kind of um, spectral curve construction tells you that to, to make a bundle and a Higgs field, you should just write a line bundle on, a spectral, on the spectral curve, right? So but some of this data already matches up. The new thing here seems to be that the abelian connection on, um, on upstairs actually determines um, this flat connection on E for generic choices of the line bundle L. So there is some cohomology vanishing thing here, um, but that, that's the claim. Okay. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that there's an obvious family of, um, well, there's a family of isomonodromy connections for this map. And if I pull it back by this birational equivalence, I will get a pencil of connections on here of course, it may develop some poles, but that's absolutely to be expected. So here's, here's the diagram. I want to also introduce the character variety, which is where, um, you know, monodromy of these connections, um, of, the, of, of the connections on the, on the rank two bundle E is gonna live. So this is fundamental group of the surface of genus G, um, and G is PGL2. That's because I'm talking about rank two bundles. And so here's the picture. I can consider this kind of trivial bundle it with five as the character variety. I can consider this space P of G where I had S, a bundle E and a connection and a Higgs field. And I can map that to the monodromy of this connection. And if I ask that to be constant, you know, basically I just pull back the kind of obvious trivial connection on this trivial bundle 
via this map, I will get some nonlinear connection here, so which would be an isomonodromy connection. And, but I can vary epsilon here, so I get a whole pencil of them, and then I just transfer this over to here. And since this, as we said, is basically the tangent bundle of M, modulo the lattice, um, this is exactly where we wanted that pencil of connections to live. Okay. So that's just what I've been saying. And so the conjecture is that this, this construction does what you need it to do. Um, and the bit that's a bit tricky here is that um, you're going to end up with um, a kind of family of connections here, depending on epsilon. So if you lift a vector field here, you're going to get some family of vector fields up here, depending on epsilon. And what you really need those is that those are a pencil. So they, they just kind of depend linearly on epsilon or epsilon inverse. You know, they're not some complicated function of epsilon. They're just one vector field plus epsilon inverse times another vector field. And you can call it, so really what, to prove that, you really need to understand the behavior of this near epsilon equals zero and show that it's kind of bounded, or show that it has a, a nice limit. So really this comes down to some kind of WKB information about this family of connections. So that's, that's the kind of tricky thing you have to prove. Um, and I'm not claiming to have proved this. Okay. And so let me just say that the one example I have worked out in, in, in great detail is um, the A2 case. So this is where we do allow some poles. We actually just allow, we're in genus zero and we allow quadratic differentials with a single pole of order seven. And this is, uh, Ivan explained exactly this case yesterday. So um, it's uh, the space of stability conditions mod auto equivalences is C2 minus this um, discriminant locus um, divided by Z mod five. You have to act by the roots of unity, but don't worry about that. And this parameterizes the following, these quadratic differentials on P1. And then as Ivan said, the central charge coordinates, you take the square root of this differential and you integrate it between zeros of the quadratic differential. Okay. And when you go through all this, so one thing I, I sort of stuck it here, if you compute this linear, you can compute the linear Joyce connection here and it is the thing with A and B as flat coordinates. So, you know, I think um, the Coulomb branch in this example would um, involve fixing one of these coordinates and varying the other. I guess fixing A and varying B um, I think would be the correct thing. That's correct. So that's exactly this property that it's, it's, just, it's just kind of flat in these coordinates. Okay, so this is, and this is a fairly non-trivial thing, you know. So, I mean, in, from the stability condition space, you just, you've only got these coordinates. You've got no access to these things. You've just got these coordinates, the central charge coordinates. And somehow using DT invariance and going through all this rigmarole, you end up constructing this connection where A and B are the flat coordinates. Um, <clears throat> and that seems to be a good thing. Okay, so I'll um, maybe finish here. So uh, this is just continuing this example. So let me just explain a little bit what's going on here. So those line bundles L, um, which were living on the spectral curve, this is the, the spectral curve is, is kind of y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Um, the line bundle on the spectral curve should have degrees two. So I have to write down two points on, on the spectral curve. One of them is going to be the point at infinity and the other one is this point. And, you know, I should write down a connection, an abelian connection on that thing. So that just comes down to this coordinate R basically. I mean, away from the point at infinity, you can think of connections as just, um, uh, uh, one forms, in fact. And so since the elliptic curve has got trivial tangent bundle, it's just a complex number. <clears throat> um, and so they correspond to this connection and this Higgs field. And this Higgs field is a very familiar thing um, in panel of A literature. I mean, people study, you know, D plus one over H times this thing and isomonodromic deformations of that thing are controlled by um, the panel of A1 equation. Sticking this extra R term in causes trouble and 
you know, it's a little bit, you know, so I'm not quite considering the usual thing described by a panel of A1, but it's certainly very closely related. And, and it's possible there's not really any other information. I, I guess that's what I really believe, but it's some sort of slight variance on it. Um, <clears throat> and then you can actually go ahead and compute the Plavansky function and you get this. I mean, which the interesting thing about this is that it's a rational function, which I, I guess I, I wouldn't have necessarily expected. Um, so that was quite a, a painful calculation. Um, so uh, I think, yes, my time is up. So did I want to say anything more about this example? Um, yeah, I should say that um, this was partly joint work with um, Davide Masuero, who um, was the person who could do the WKB analysis for me. And, uh, and so we wrote a joint paper on this. But uh, yes, OK, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. Any questions? When you had your, yeah, I have a question. When you had your X and M, you said that, the, um, well, M is basically totally geodesic. Yeah? You restrict the levi chivita connection and you get a torsion free flat connection on M. Right. But is the Levi Civita connection on a Levi Civita connection on X is not flat, is it? No, it's not no, absolutely it's not flat. No. Okay. Um, and this is this is something that you know I don't I don't even have a very conceptual explanation for why this works. Um, How do you know it's not flat? So it's um, the, the, you can work out its curvature in terms of the, um, it, the it's the fourth derivatives of W that co yeah. come up. I mean, exactly okay. like this but with four derivatives. So, you know, the curvature of something, you can just work out the curvature. Um, and I think basically it, this is because I'm assuming that W is odd. So when you take the fourth derivatives, it's still odd. And then if you look at theta equals zero, it vanishes. So, I mean, it's really to do with its oddness. Um, but that oddness is, is somehow very natural in this story. It's analogous to the fact that, um, you know, in, um, in the Frobenius manifold story, the, um, I mean, it, it basically comes, where does this oddness come from? It comes from the fact that dt of gamma is dt of minus gamma. It's that, it's that involution. So the Stokes data has some symmetry to it. Um, uh, th th there's a similar symmetry in the Frobenius manifold story as well, which is to do with the kind of inverse transpose um, operation. But yeah, so th this oddness is, it, it, it is caused by the symmetry of the DT invariance and it's non-trivial and it has this, in, in particular, this consequence that, um, that this, you get this extra flat connection on, on the base N. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, so, so you you say that the these physicist slicest things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm imagining it. You you want to do something like recover the uh, the modelized space of complex structures on a Calabi tree or something, right? As in terms of kind of constant coordinates from the kind of the other coordinate set system. Um, I know, how much do you know, do you know about this in examples? Um, the... Well, I mean, again, I should add the, um, the caution that um, Greg reminded us of that if I took a compact Calabi CY3, this story I've described would probably break in an interesting way. But, you know, maybe this still happens. But actually, I have computed an example, which is the, um, um, well, the resolved conifold and actually any example where, um, what do I want to say? Where basically the where there are no compact divisors. So if I take a non-compact Calabi R threefold with no compact divisors, so that's quite a, a simple case, then, um, then you can do all this stuff and you can work out this, um, this linear Joyce connection. And um, indeed, um, it's exactly the right thing. I mean, it's given in terms of these ZIs um, I'll actually explain this in the next talk, but um, you can also write this connection 
by writing some function f of the zi coordinates and, and putting here the third derivatives of f. So that f is a prepotential on stab, and you can compute it, and it's exactly the genus zero gromov witten generating function. So that's exactly what you would expect from mirror symmetry should give you the, um, the periods of the mirror. So um, yeah, so the, the, I think there's good evidence that this sort of works. Um, Thank you. Any questions? Seems to be no more questions. Okay, great, thank you. If not, let's thank Thomas again, uh, Tom again for his lovely talk. And I don't know if any of the organizers want to say anything, but if not, we meet back tomorrow afternoon or morning, depending on where.